I made um, an album in the 70s. Russ Regan signed me to 20th Century Records, and well. I made three albums for that label. And the first album had Hollywood Town, which was later recorded by Manfred Mann, Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady, Helen Reddy heard my version on the radio. And so she recorded that. And then uh, That's the Way It Is With You that the Partridge family recorded that's still on their television show that keeps popping up on YouTube. And then I made two more albums for that label. And then I weathered out disco and started writing for film and TV and got signed to Joe Bett. It was actually Stone Diamond because I'm an ASCAP writer. And then I started writing with Misha Siegel, a brilliant Israeli composer for films and songwriter. And we wrote a song for a film called Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon, remember it well. called First Time on a Ferris Wheel. And uh, 30 people have sung it, but it, it has never really been a hit, but it's sort of known. Misha and I wrote lots of songs for film and TV with New Adventures of Pippi Longstocking, The Secret Garden, uh, Life and Adventures of Santa Claus. We had quite a long stretch there. And then in the 90s, I met Nick Vinay, who produced more records on me because I hadn't recorded since the 70s. But in the 90s, I made a few more records and then I made, an, I made seven in all. But for me, I just make records so people will hear them and record my songs. <laughs> They're your demos, basically. Yeah, well, in a way, except yeah. I do have a bit of a following as a singer-songwriter, so it's, it's fun to put out a record. I see no reason to ever do that again, though. Now we have Spotify and all the things I'm on already, so. I grew up in Dallas, and um, I married an actor. This is another life, but... Uh, and I moved out here because he had to. I was really close to my family. I probably wouldn't have gone. And then right away I got a publishing deal. We broke up and I wanted to be a playwright. I studied playwriting at the Dallas Theater Center and I wrote screenplays when I was out here. <laughs> and I discovered it took months and months to write a screenplay nothing was going to happen with. And it only took maybe a day or two to write a song nothing was going to happen with. So I, you know, I thought songwriting is definitely the way to go. You know, he was an actor, so I didn't really have the heart to mention any kind of dormant desire to act. But then I met Henry Jaglum and started writing songs for him. And then he put me in a play that I was in for a year, and then I was in the movie of that play and in a, another movie of his. So the movie that I was actually just an actor in was just 45 minutes from Broadway. So that was fun. I mean, my careers are like my closet. I don't get rid of the old stuff. I just keep bringing new ones in, and so it, it gets kind of crowded around here. In high school, I always played the piano for certain stunt nights we would have, and then in college, I was in a sorority. I know this is politically incorrect, but hey, I was a Kappa. And so we had this, between all the sororities, uh, competitions. So I would write these little musicals, you know, and we won both years I wrote it. And I thought, wouldn't that be great to do that for a living? But of course, that's a pipe dream. So. Yes, I always wanted to do that, but it never occurred to me I could really do it and make a living. I was playing a place called the Bitter End West. It was a gay club, uh, which was the only place you could play original material. Everybody was doing covers. So I played there and I developed a following. And um, I mean, those guys were not there to see the white chick at the piano, you know what I mean? They were there to meet each other, so I had to enroll them into my show. So I started talking before every song and introducing it and getting them involved, which became kind of a trademark of mine later. At one ASCAP meeting, I met Roger Gordon, who said, are you playing anywhere? So he went to the Bitter End West and signed me to a, a publishing deal. Well, first I was on Columbia Records, but then it, they had a big payola scandal and everyone Jack Gold signed got dropped. <laughs> then I got signed to 20th Century Records with Russ Regan, which was a much better fit. 
Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady was supposed to be my single. There was a music director who, at a top 40 station who really loved the song, but he wanted it sped up because he was chemically altered at the time and everything had to be fast. <laughs> So believe it or not, Russ Regan recalled the record, sped it up. That um, radio station and another top 40 in San Francisco were poised to go on it. And that music director quit the Friday before the Monday they were going on the record and they lost the record. And the, uh, Paul Loveless, who was the promotion man at the time at 20th, is still talking about it. I mean, which is like... It was fine because I didn't really have the machine behind me that Helen Reddy did, and she made a beautiful record of it, don't get me wrong, but my label was crushed. Misha Siegel and I had been told by someone at Motown, I think it was Suzanne Costin, she said, write a love song for this movie, you know, so we wrote this song, and we went to Mr. Gordy's house, Barry Gordy, and we played it for him. He said, what do you mean you've written a love song? There's no love scene in this movie. What are you talking about? So we played it, and he said, I am reshooting the end of the movie for this song. And he called the head of TriStar at 2 in the morning and said, get over here. You've got to hear this. So that was the most exciting thing that we've ever experienced. Now, Carl Anderson was singing the demo, and he was brilliant, as you know. Smokey Robinson sang it in the movie, so it was a little different feel, you know. And then many people have sung it since. Now, later... Misha and I were on a television show called uh, We Write the Songs, or You Write the Songs, or whatever it was. Somebody you write. write the songs. We were on there. We were competing, and we got up to the top number one with that song, with a, tr a truncated version of it. It was for $100,000. <laughs> and the song that actually ended up winning, we had beaten in the preliminaries, but it was, uh, it, it, I won't get into the whole story behind the scenes because it has to do with who voted for whom and who sang it and who was on what label. But it's all in the book, Horror Stories of the Music Business. <laughs> I host a showcase uh, called Snap, Sunday Night at the Pavilion, and I have for four years, and I showcase the most wonderful singer-songwriters. June 29th, I'm very excited about a show that Patricia Whiteman, who's like the darling of the cabaret circuit, but she's also a fabulous pop singer, she's doing an evening of my songs, and it's really kind of a retrospective of my career from the 70s, you know? And she's singing, my eight-piece band is behind her. Gary Lynn Floyd is flying in from Texas to do a duet with her on Ferris Wheel. And I'm, I'm really excited. It's at the E-Spot. We sold out last year a week before the show. I hope that we sell out again. So if you're listening, buy a Tell ticket. Them. What's the E-Spot? The E-Spot the Tellos, is right? at Vitello's, yeah. In Studio City. June 29th. It's a Thursday night. There's that. You know, I am teaching. I probably should mention that in 1985, USC called me and said they wanted to start a songwriting course and they wanted me to teach it. And I said, well, it can't be taught. So in 1986, they called me again. And I felt like, you know, gosh, if, if they're honoring me with this, I should say yes. So I didn't have any idea how to teach it. And then over the years, I have perfected this step-by-step -step method that enables either a beginner or a very advanced writer to get from this level to that level in their writing. And I, I love it. I have some of the best writers studying with me. I'm so, so privileged. I think they should read something that a lot of people forget to do. They should read novels, they should read poetry. I mean, modern poetry like Charles Bukowski. You know, they should read um, anything that is really well written to just get the idea of language that communicates clearly, but saying a lot in a few words, saying it visually, saying it conversationally, things like that. They should also listen to really great songs and try to figure out what that writer was doing. And then they should write a lot, not necessarily songs, they should just write. 
I love Quack because they're all these writers I've respected and some of them I don't know. Most of them I do know, but I don't know their hidden gems and I can go and find them, you know? It's wonderful and you also have archived interviews like this one and I can learn a lot from other writers. 